cat is a creature beyond compare. No animal has a character more complex or a story so full of contradiction. The domestic cat has been worshipped as a god, condemned as the devil, and today is idolised once more. Soon its numbers will make it the most popular pet in the world. A pet, yet with all the skills of a wild creature. The cosiest of cats retain the heart of the hunter. I am the cat who walks by himself. The words of the writer Rudyard Kipling immortalize the cat's independent spirit. It may have come to live with us in our homes to share our lives, but it's been tamed on its own terms. Has the domestic cat ever really been domesticated? It's a story as mysterious and enigmatic as the animal itself. This is New York's Madison Square Garden's cat show. And it was here in 1895 that the first official American cat show was held. And this is an Egyptian Mao. It must be the oldest natural breed of cat in existence. And it has every right to claim a direct descendancy from the dawn of domestication of the cat in ancient Egypt. the Grand Bazaar of Cairo, and a scene that's remained virtually unchanged for centuries. It was in such a setting in old Egypt that the story of the domestic cat began. The ancestors of these cats have prowled amid such a patchwork of ancient alleyways for three and a half thousand years. The relationship between cat and man is at its oldest in Egypt. Even before domestication, it was revered as a god. For well over a thousand years, it was a national deity, a major god. The worship of cats, both small and big, dates back much further to the time of the Sphinx with its human head and lion's body. Triumphant over the enemies of Egypt, the cat goddess Bastet was also portrayed as a lioness by the early pharaohs. The Egyptians' adoration of the cat's mythical powers was portrayed in the sun god Ra. They believed that as a cat, Ra magically held the sun's rays in its reflective eyes as it prepared to fight the serpent of night. It was an eternal battle that ended with the dawning of the new day and began again as darkness fell over the Nile. As the cat became domesticated in Egypt, so too did the goddess Bastet. She began to be worshipped now as the small cat. During the 19th century, many cat bronze statues found their way to Europe. 
pillaged with other treasures from archaeological sites throughout Egypt. So it's hard to know from which cat cult centers they came. Most must have been unearthed from the ancient city of Bubastis in the Nile Delta. Here, worship of the domestic cat reached its zenith. Its temple, dedicated to Bastet, dates back to the earliest times of cat worship and was begun by the same fairies who built the Sphinx. When in 945 BC, Bubastis was made the capital of all Egypt, the local cat fertility goddess Bastet was elevated to that of a national deity. The cat became so revered that when one died, its owners shaved off their eyebrows in mourning. And if a cat was killed by a charioteer, he was stoned to death by the mob. In her temple, the pharaoh himself made offerings to Bastet. With four kittens at her feet, symbolic of her fertility, she was often portrayed as a cat-headed woman, shaking a sacred rattle known as a sistrum. We know what took place at Bubastis from the Greek writer Herodotus, who visited in the 5th century BC when the cat cult was at its height. Singing and clapping as they sailed up the Nile, women came from all over Egypt to celebrate the annual feast of Bastet. The women shook their sistra, symbols of fertility. More wine was drunk than during the rest of the year. And passing towns on the riverbank, the women would provocatively lift their clothes above their heads. When the women arrived by the boatload, waving their sistra and yelling, there were 700,000 of them. It was the greatest annual pilgrimage in all of ancient Egypt. And they were coming to here, the great temple of the cat goddess Bastet. But today, there's not one stone that remains standing upon another. And yet, when you look at the detail on them, you get something of the feeling that made Herodotus write when he visited here. There is no temple as pleasing to the eye as that of Bubastis. The temple stands in the midst of the city and is visible wheresoever you are. The gateway is 60 feet high and ornamented by figures cut upon the stone. Two artificial channels from the River Nile encompass the building, each 100 feet wide and shaded by trees. And within the shrine stands the image of the goddess. The gold mask of Tutankhamun. Strangely, it was the discovery of a wooden mummy case of a cat that led to the pharaoh's tomb. Excavated by Lord Carnarvon in 1907, it excited his interest in Egyptology. Fifteen years later, he and Howard Carter made their greatest discovery. They made a hole into the tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and by the light of a candle glimpsed its splendour, including gold beds and chairs shaped like big cats. Tutankhamun's undisturbed grave also revealed one of the most strikingly opulent of all cat images. On the side of the pharaoh's chamber, chiselled in sheet gold, sat a serene bastet. In ancient Egypt, it was believed that preservation of the body was essential for continued existence in the afterlife. The bodies of pharaohs and courtiers were mummified, wrapped in treated linen and buried in ornate coffins. Cats, too, were destined for the afterlife. So the same elaborate treatment was lavished on sacred temple cats and those belonging to the nobility. On this finely carved limestone coffin for a royal cat, she sits before an offering table in the afterlife as if she were a person of noble birth. The hieroglyphics call her Lady Cat. She belonged to Prince Tuthmosis, uncle of Tutankhamun. Inside the stone sarcophagus, the embalmed cat once sat in a gilded wooden mummy case. 
but most cats were afforded far more humble treatment in a cult that spread right across Egyptian society. When house cats died, they were taken to Bubastis and other shrines to be mummified or cremated before being buried in sacred repositories. Millions of cats were mummified, as well as some of their wild ancestors. At the temples, cats were specially reared and sold as mummies to be offered at the shrine. The Egyptians had great reverence for the cat, but as with many religions, it also involved ritual sacrifice. It may help to explain why unwrapped cat mummies have sometimes been found to have had their necks broken. So who were the wild ancestors of the cats that would live alongside the pharaohs as their gods? New clues to this ancient detective story are hard to find. So the domestication of the domestic cat still remains an unsolved riddle. This is the European forest wildcat, which in Britain is called the Scottish wildcat. It's the best known of the 25 species of small wild cats living round the world. The forest wildcat will breed with domestic cats, although the offspring usually have the aggressive instincts of the wild cat. It's more likely that this was the cat that was transformed from a wild animal into a domestic pet. It's the paler, southern form of the forest wildcat the African wildcat. Some are heavily spotted, others more finely striped in appearance. All have a fierce beauty. So how could this wary predator ever have become domesticated? The answer may be found today by searching the streets of any town or village along the shores of the Mediterranean. Feral or gone wild domestic cats are a familiar sight, often dozing lazily in the sun. But when it comes to food, these supreme hunters, equipped with equally impressive teeth and claws as their wild counterparts, have a different idea. They exist by scavenging, as any holidaymaker visiting a taverna can testify. These enterprising scavengers are perhaps reenacting the very birth of the domestic cat. Maybe those African wildcats were initially attracted by easy prey, the rodents who also joined man in the early towns. Then, just like today's Mediterranean cats, they discovered more plentiful supplies of food to be scavenged or stolen. But there's another, more intriguing way in which the cat may have become domesticated. And for that, we must travel back down the Nile. The ancient Egyptians also mummified another cat, the jungle cat that lived here in the Nile marshes. In a remote desert valley in central Egypt, a cat temple was carved into the rocks by Queen Hatshepsut. This female pharaoh had it made around 1470 BC, enlarging a much earlier shrine to Paquette, the cat goddess of Middle Egypt, who was worshipped in the same way as Bastet. Within these walls, the jungle cat was kept captive by the temple priests. One of the ways in which domestication may have occurred was in a cat's temple. And due to the age of Paquette's temple, I think it could well have happened here. 
with the unnatural confining together in the temple precincts of the jungle cat and the African wildcat, it would be most surprising if breeding didn't occur, and that could lead to a fertile hybrid. The jungle cat has a far gentler manner than the African wildcat, so the addition of its genes may have been crucial in the evolution of our domestic cat. Surprisingly, its significance has been largely overlooked. The ancient Egyptians could only have become familiar with this shy and elusive animal by keeping it captive. The vital evidence that they did so can be found in a tomb at Beni Hassan, close to Paquette's temple. Dating from 2000 BC, this is one of the earliest tomb paintings of a cat and is such a superbly accurate study of the jungle cat that it must have been drawn from ones kept captive at the temple. An extension of the cat temple was built around 300 BC, at a time when there was a great increase in the numbers of cats being mummified, although the site was later plundered. But the temple still holds a vital clue about the mysterious ancestry of the domestic cat. a bat cave more than a cat cave. As the cat mummies were plundered so extensively, it's not really been possible to know for sure what species of cat were here. But I found some bones around the cave which give us more than an idea. Because this is certainly a cat bone. You can always tell by the loop on the bone of the hind leg. And amongst the cat bones, I've got the African wild cat and also the domestic cat. But most importantly, was the jungle cat here to add its genes to the mixture? And the answer is yes, because this is the neck bone of a jungle cat. So the wall painting was absolutely right. They were here. Unfortunately, during the second half of the 19th century, the widespread plundering of cat mummies and bronzes swept away much of the other evidence about the true origin of the domestic cat. Near Paquette's temple, the children of Benny Hassan relive the discovery and destruction of their cat cemetery. A villager digging in the desert had found hundreds of thousands of cat mummies packed into layers 20 deep. The bones were used for tooth powder while the wrappings went as manure. The children took the most attractive mummies to the bank of the River Nile. There, they sold them for a few coins to passing travellers. A handful of the more elaborate mummies found their way to the world's museums and to collectors, but no one was interested in the huge number that remained. So great was the quantity of mummies that 19 tons were carried to Liverpool by the steamer Pharaohs in 1889. This priceless evidence was sold as fertiliser. Sadly, only one skull from that Liverpool consignment has survived, and that's kept by Dr. Juliet Clutton Brock at the Natural History Museum in London. Julian, have you got the famous one here? This one. Uh, this is with the rather, rather sad tale. Yes. Th this is the one from the 19 ton shipment, is it? Yes, that's right. And that skull somehow made its way to the Royal College of Surgeons, yeah. and then it was given here. But all the rest were just ground down into fertiliser. It, it's at a time when we could have found out so much about the cat by having that great range of numbers that have been kept for thousands of years, safe and secure, and just at the last minute when we could have done something with them, smash everything gone. At least we've got the one. At least we've yes. got the one. With such scant evidence, it's difficult to trace just how the cat became domesticated. This Egyptian village, however, holds the key to something equally important, when it happened. The houses of the village near Luxor have hardly changed for centuries. On the hillside above are the entrances to the ancient tombs of noblemen. 
all that remains of the original village of Deir el Medina that was built three and a half thousand years ago. It housed the workmen who toiled on the secret construction of the tombs in the nearby valleys of the kings and queens. This skilled community also made their own tombs, reflecting their way of life. On the walls they drew paintings of their cats. Often they were symbolic. After all, what cat can be taught by man to hunt and retrieve? Instead, the imagery represented fertility and pleasure. In more domestic scenes, the cat is always drawn under the wife's chair to enhance her fertility for the next life. The paintings offer proof that the cat and her kittens had finally come to live with people around 1500 BC. Today around the village, a mackerel striped tom scavenges just as cats must have done three and a half thousand years ago at the dawn of their domestication. In the kitchens and yards of Deir al-Medina, they would have searched for scraps. They would have scavenged too in the narrow streets, as they still do today amid the hubbub of the old bazaar in Cairo. There is a centuries-old tradition of giving food to stray and feral cats in the bazaar. A 13th century ruler bequeathed the annual profits from an orchard near Cairo to feed them. Today, they depend on the kindness of shopkeepers. The Warren of alleyways is similar to those ancient towns, which became local islands supporting high numbers of cats. More would breed in one generation than many generations of their wild ancestors could over thousands of square miles of desert. In this way, towns became a selection pressure that gradually changed the animal. Yet since that time, the essential character of the cat has remained unchanged. The enigmatic statues of Bastet appeal as much to tourists in the bazaar as they did to her worshippers all those years ago. But the basic question remains. Did the domestic cat have its origins in the town or the temple? The answer may be here, in the Egyptian desert. Until now, despite widespread excavation work, far too few cat mummies have survived to supply enough information. It's been a scientific guessing game. Then, quite suddenly, there was a great breakthrough. A French archaeologist excavating a tomb at Saqqara, a huge city of the dead beyond the west bank of the Nile, stumbled upon thousands of cat mummies heaped in its tunnels and shafts. The significance of Alain Zivi's discovery was that unlike the few grand mummies treasured in museums, these were the normal run-of-the-mill types just bound in rough bandaging. Large numbers of the mummies were of kittens. Alan, I think this is one of the most wonderful ones, because as you've eased back the material, you can see the fur of the animal, not just the bones. Yes, it's quite uh, astonishing. We found a real cat with the fur, which is uh, really fantastic, because the, the animal is complete. It, it was mummified uh, without removing the internal organs, like for the human beings, and uh, the fur is still here, and they are 
more or less all yellow uh, orange with uh, sometimes with stripes which was your first one <laughs> um, you said you yes the you first one yes is uh, here can you recognize it it's is it's very cute. I, I must say he is very cute because he, it's it has still its nose uh, and a part of the skin the eyelids. and uh, for me it has a really quite a meaning uh, because it's you always remember the first cat and <laughs> the difference between that and this monster yes, besides you. Yes, but like this ones, we have not so many. Yes. Maybe there were more, but they were plundered. And I'm sure that many of them, which are in the museum now, the coffins and the statues, come from here, from Saqqara, and the, which was the main uh, cemetery, a cat cemetery, for the robbers in the 19th century. We know already that the cats date from the period when mummification was at its height in Egypt. A full investigation is now essential. The sands of the desert may at last be yielding up the secrets of the cat and its worship, whose origins are almost as old as the pyramids themselves. The inscrutable Sphinx has remained a silent witness to those mysterious beginnings, the birth of a species, the domestic cat. Before I left Egypt, I returned to the pillage site of Pakat's temple, perhaps the place where the cat's story really began. Who were the elusive ancestors of our domestic cat? Just the African wildcat? Or was the jungle cat involved? Then one last unexpected and remarkable discovery. For a hundred years, we'd believed that the cat cemeteries at Paquette's temple had been completely mined out. But I'm over the moon because I found an entire seam which runs for at least a hundred foot that way, another hundred foot over there, and it goes right back into the body of the cliff. And it's absolutely chock-a-block with bones. We've got long bones of cat. We've got teeth here. There's skulls, absolutely perfect. Because this may be where domestication occurred, these bones might at last give us the key to properly understanding the origin of the domestic cat.